Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to our session, folks. It's good to see a lot of you are starting to join. My name is Arturo Hamilton, folks. I'll be your trainer this week on the AC305 session, the architecting and design. Thank you for joining. Thank you for joining. Remember, this is a special uh, kind of event for all of you. The idea is that you can uh, get your hands into the knowledge and the content related to designing Microsoft solutions. Uh, as I mentioned, well, it's the AC305 session. That's the official name of our class. Uh, first of all, first of all, as I said, welcome and thank you for joining. This is an official Microsoft content class. Okay, that means that everything we will see, everything we will use, everything we will cover during the next five days is actually offered and authorized by Microsoft. That will give you a little bit of peace of mind that you know that I didn't modify anything and everything is delivered as expected. I'm a certified trainer. I will introduce myself in a, in a minute. So you, you know who's talking on this side of the microphone, okay? But the idea is that you are all, uh, well, uh, under the knowledge that this is an official content. We have a satisfaction guarantee, folks. Remember, all this content that we're covering this week is actually, uh, well, present to you the best way possible according to Microsoft feedback and all the things that you will be sharing with us. So it's just for you to know. And remember that at the end of the class, uh, we'll have an excellent prep that will give you some benefits for the certification exam. Okay, so you'll you'll be having the option to get one of the vouchers that will be given away to take a free exam. In this case, the AC three hundred five. So best of luck for that. But before 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 we we continue, folks, let me just get here this one. Sorry that I'm turning around my face. I'm actually going through uh, uh, the whole process, but. It is important you know, it is important you know that this session, my friends, is actually an advanced class, okay? I will introduce myself so you know who's on this side of the microphone, so you, you know who's actually teaching the class for you. Let me just go here for a minute. There, you can see me. So you know, you know who's here uh, uh, talking, and then we will, I'll proceed to close my camera again, but I want you to see my face and you know that I'm not an artificial intelligence, okay? First of all, I'm a certified trainer. I've been a certified trainer for a few years now. Actually, I've been teaching classes for the last seven years. I'm a certified expert in the whole, the whole Azure certification track and security tracks of cloud, Microsoft 365. Exchange, Dynamics, CRM, ERP, all that stuff. On-premises technologies like um, Windows Server, uh, System Center, etc. And well, before before I was a trainer, folks, I used to be, um, uh, <laughs> let's say, a multi-skilled IT officer back in my day in the UK. I was working in the UK on a bank. I was there for almost uh, 2000. 2016 so i was there for a few years 12 years to be uh, exact and well i had a chance of testing a lot of different technologies i use a lot of that knowledge to to, to be prepared okay so um, important folks i've been teaching since 2016 i'm actually getting my seven years batch on january that's why i'm now referring to as a seven years of experience but well, six years and 11 months okay I'm also an independent cloud consultant, so uh, well, that's also part of the things I do on my free time. And uh, well, you can scan the QR code that you have on the screen and add me to LinkedIn if you want. I'm there to connect with any of you who is attending this class. Okay, and a little bit of my personal like hobbies. So you see that I'm also uh, a human. <laughs> I love uh, photography. I love to watch weird movies. I love to read. I actually try to read a lot. I love comic books. I love video games. I actually have a comic book shop and collectible shop where I spend most of my free time. It's not a lot, but that's where I spend most of my free time. And well, that's how I balance my, my personal life with training Microsoft and cloud in general. Okay, so as I said, folks, I'm going to be here with you. I'm just going to keep the camera off. So the whole experience and it's easier for you to track down the object. I'll be opening the camera, okay? Don't worry. Actually, I'll be, I'll be opening the camera. Uh, we have a small break and, and a couple of things there, so that's just to keep you folks. But now that you know who's here with you folks, the next thing that I would like to do, continuing here with our content, is the experience. We are all using the uh, Elite Studio from 24, our Microsoft platform. You, have, you can see a lot of things here and there. We have a question, question and answers uh, section 
we have uh, moderators, so the answers, the questions will be answered by, by the team. If there is something quite specific about the content we are presenting, I might take the answer on my hands. Since we have only two hours, I try to focus on the content, while the moderators give us a hand with all the other non-related to the topic questions. But I'll, I'll try to help in, in both areas. Uh, as I said, we only have two hours, two hours per day, the whole week, two hours for the, for, for the lecture, okay, because we have another two and a half hours for practices. But we have a small break. I will give you five, six minutes uh, in between the, the two hours, so you can stretch the legs, get some coffee, get some water, or maybe just go out and get some fresh air before continuing. I think that's that's the way, way the best way to keep you like in optimal state to attend the class. Okay, that's that's the plan for the day. But remember, the sessions are being recorded. You'll have access to the recordings in the next 10 business days. You cannot download them, but you will be able to watch them multiple times. Okay, yes, that's what actually I just answered, uh, uh, so you, we got that. So yes, I'll, I'll, we will have the recordings and those will be available on your platform in the next 10 business days. So yes, the answer is yes. For any of you wondering if we have our recording, okay? Now, um, the solutions architect folks, I would like to be pretty honest. This class is different from all the other Azure classes, okay? And that's a pretty important thing because it's actually implicit on the name, designing, designing solutions. It is not, it is not a, a regular hands-on class like the others that you may have seen or you may have taken in the past. This class, my friends, it's, uh, I'll, I'll, I, I go to the portal, I use demos, I use everything I can to give you some uh, tools to, to grasp on the knowledge, but it is important you get that it's designing, designing solutions. The exercises on control of all the other classes are actually designing based on, on case studies. You don't have a hands-on lab, the same way you do, for example, on the management class or the database classes. That's an important part, okay? The last 10 minutes of today, I'll take the time to show you where to access the labs or how to access the designing solutions. So you can uh, take the second part of the day for that, but it's important you get it. You are going to acquire the knowledge to go through the complete design process of a cloud solution, regardless of the components that you consider relevant for your workload. That means that you can be focusing on networking, you might be focusing on computing, you might be focusing on databases, but well, at the end of the day, you'll be capable of using any of those solutions. That's the plan of this class. Okay, that's the core of this class. Now, something important, folks, this is, just give me one second here because I have the other the other slide deck that we will be using right now. Let me just see where is it, there it is. So this is our um, expectations of the week. You can see here, this is what we're gonna cover. I need you to pay quite special attention to this because as I said, we have two hours. So today we'll talk about governance, tomorrow we'll talk about storage. On day three, we'll talk about applications and authorization. And on day four, we will talk about networks and business continuity and disaster recovery. On day five, Friday, we will talk about exam. Okay, it's an exam preparation uh, session. All the labs are case studies. I like to repeat that. I need to repeat that a lot of times because it's not a regular lab like those that you may have seen before. Okay, so these labs, as I said, are completely based on you designing on a paper no hands-on labs like any other class. That's why it's a level three class because it's all about abstract designing, okay? So that's that's important. We also have the moderators here during the chat session. I'll also be around. We don't have a voice channel on that uh, part, but you can actually use the, the Q&A section on any questions you might have. So I'll, I'll come back to that topic in the last 10 minutes of the day. So. This is, this is for our class. You have um, a learn on demand solution where you can access your information, okay? Let me uh, uh, share with you this. You can go to, to Bing, to the web search, put down AC305, there you can see the results. And here you have the Learn Microsoft with all the materials of the class, okay? Something important, folks, since we only have two hours instead of the usual eight hours of a regular standard class, 
I'll be, I'll be teaching some topics and you'll have to take care of the others, okay? I'll be teaching half of the class and you'll be, you'll have access to this. So for free, you can actually take all the other stuff. Like for example, today I'm gonna go for governance. You may wanna go for, well, I'll, I'll mention which topics are we supposed to cover each of the days. Okay, so that's one of the things. And AC305, the first result you get on a search engine and that's our learn microsoft.com. So that's just to be prepared. We have, as I said, the case studies. The case studies will drive you to an abstract way of designing the solutions for a customer called, well, in this case, Tail Tailwind Traders. That's the name of our hypothetical company, okay? I'll show you this at the end of today. So you're ready and you can take the, the last sessions to practice this or you can take the last sessions, for example, to continue studying the other topics. That's that's a little bit of up to you uh, decision, given well the type of exercises we have on this module, this lesson. Okay. So that we mentioned, my friends, I think it's time we get started. I think it's time to go through the actual uh, content of our session calls for day one. Let me just get it here for you. There, you should be seeing it now. This is designing a governance solution. Okay, we're gonna talk about governance on today's session. First of all, what do we have on this lesson? You can see here, we're gonna talk about governance. We're gonna talk about, uh, let's say the, the hierarchy of an Azure solution, okay? We will talk about uh, how Microsoft uh, gives us the options to design a proper subscription, a proper management solution within uh, Azure. That's that's the idea of today, okay? Now, what we have in here, folks, what we can uh, do to start, it's first of all, understanding the governance. When we talk about governance, folks, we may have a lot uh, of different options, a lot of different scenarios where you may want to have a plan before you even start, right? That's why it's designing. So what about governance, folks? Azure has a logic hierarchy that we all need to know. Without these folks, we are completely lost. This is the first thing we need to learn from this class. How Azure is designed, folks? If we take a look top to bottom, we have all the way to the top, the management groups, okay? The management groups are the top of the hierarchy. Then we have subscriptions, we have the resources, and finally, we have, sorry, the resource groups, and finally we have the resources. This is pretty important. And as, as I was mentioned, determine your plan, folks. How are you planning to, to go for a solution? Let's say, hey, what is a management group? Let's explain and drill down into these levels so we know where we are, okay? First of all, we have on the highest level something called the management group. What is a management group, folks? This is an abstract question because you, you will see the word groups in a lot of different cases, in a lot of different options. A management group, folks, is an option that we have to create a top level solution of hierarchy. Think about this scenario. You get multiple subscriptions, okay? You have five, six, seven, eight, a hundred different subscriptions. You need to make responsible part of your team for specific parts of that subscription. You need, for example, let's say uh, you're a specialist on, on networking to be capable of managing all the different subscriptions, but you only have one user capable of managing the computers. How do you granulate this subscription management? That's the first thing you have to wonder. How should I do this? This is on the top. Okay, there are a lot of different options or scenarios to create a management group. For example, if you work for a multinational company, or if you work for a, um, a multilingual company, maybe on the same country, what you usually do is you go and say, hey, I need to manage the subscriptions uh, that use English as my language, and I need to manage the French-speaking subscriptions on a different structure, both of them for the same company, right? Well, we have the management groups. What if you have production 
quality assurance and testing or development. You need a different structure. What if you have different countries, different structure? What I'm saying here, take a look on the on, on the right. We have the, the top level management group, and then we have, for example, in this instance, different uh, divisions, different departments. So we go and say, I'm gonna have one for sales, one for marketing, one for BI, one for IT. Below there, I have one for production, one for QA, one for whatever. You see, the management groups is just logical. It will give you the option of a logic distribution for the management, for the administration. That's it. That's a management group, my friends. But important, below the management group, we have here the actual subscriptions. This is the, the second thing that we need to remember, folks. What is a subscription? Why will we have more than one subscription, folks? Remember that the subscription is the way that we will interact with Azure. Without a subscription, we cannot do anything. That's a, that's a pretty important statement. Because it's a reality, folks. If you don't get a subscription working and running, there is no way you can create a resource. There is no way you can connect to Azure. There are cases, there are scenarios where you may have one, and there are cases and scenarios where you may have 20, right? Why will you have more than one? Examples, how many times you have gone or attended a meeting where you're discussing a project, and then the different members of the meeting start uh, talking about whose budget is gonna take care of the project. And everyone is like, well, IT, right? He says, no, this is a marketing project. And, and well, you need to get to a consensus at some point, right? That's the idea of multiple subscriptions, folks. You have one subscription for marketing, one subscription for BI, for example. And then inside of that, each of them has a payment method. That's one example. Another example, we may have, as I said, a, on corporate and IT, check, check on this. Inside of corporate, we have human resources and legal subscriptions. Inside of IT, we have another management group called production. And below that, we have different services for different workloads distributed in different subscriptions box. You see how important this is? We have IT on the top, production, and three different products. Remember, we can have multiple subscriptions in one management group. We cannot have multiple management groups for one subscription, okay? That's a pretty important thing. And we can have as many as we need. We can have six levels of management groups. That means, and forgive me because I have no skills using the pen, even though I love to use it, but where's my pen? Here. So we have this one as a management group level. We can have, including the root, two, three, four, five, up to six levels of management groups. And 2,500 of them distributed to those six levels. That's it, okay? It's pretty important you remember this number because we can see multiple levels of management group. Below the management group, we have the subscriptions. Okay, so all, all the descriptions we have will always have to be low, to, sorry, to, to be part of uh, or be below a management group. That's where we start. Okay, now, how do we get a subscription? Well, as you know, we have different options, but we need a payment method. I'm gonna show you this in a second, okay? I'm gonna go through some demos so you see what I'm talking about. But before we go to that point, let me show you the next level of hierarchy so we can then go and jump to the demo we have the resource group so management group subscription and resource group what is a resource group folks this is the most important part of Azure since they changed the way we we use the product in 2016. if any of you have experience using Azure below uh, before 2016 you might remember, you might remember that we used to have a service-based portal. A service-based portal, folks, means that in the past, we used to have all the virtual machines host on a virtual machine container. 
all the networks on a network container, all the databases on a data container, and we were able to access them from each of these containers specialized for each of, type, each of the types of products. That used to be the past. In 2016, officially, Microsoft released the resource management for the solution for the resource groups. Basically, what we have, folks, is a logic container where we can put all our resources and services together. Today, folks, we have the capacity of saying, hey, I need one resource group. Uh, I, I need one resource group, for example, for marketing. We only have one subscription. Instead of having multiple subscriptions, like we said before, we just have one. I need to have or divide my services and objects via resource groups. We can do that. We can have resource groups for production, resource groups, for example, uh, for management, a resource group for, for development, or a resource group just for a specific department. There are some considerations of a resource group. Well, take, take a note here because this is important for your business as usual. Every resource group that you create is unique. You have a name that belongs to that resource group, okay, that has to be used. There. Sorry. <laughs> there, Paulo. Thanks for the, for the recommendation. Now, every resource group that we create, folks, cannot be renamed after its creation. Okay, the resource group folks can only be uh, uh, used for one service at a time. That means that if I have a computer, I cannot have that computer in two or three different resource groups. Okay, that's another thing. You cannot have one service linked to two different resource groups, it's just one. Okay, you can move resources between resource groups, but again, respecting the one at a time location. Okay, that's an important part. So we have the subscriptions and the resource groups together, both of them being part of a management group. Okay, now check this out. I'm gonna create a resource group to see the tagging. Let me show you here. And here we are. Let me go to my portal. This is the Azure portal, folks. This is where we where we get started. Thanks to you, folks, for the tip. So I can go here, select resource groups. I can hit on create and check this out. I'll be requested, folks, to select a subscription, one subscription, and to add a name. So I'm gonna call this RG305. That way we know it's our class. We have a region. We can select any of all the regions that we have. And then we have something called the tax. What are these tax books? What is tax? Think about the tax as metadata, as a label that we have as metadata to our products. Why will we need to tag? When we talk about Taxonomy, this is a topic that you may be familiar with. We talk about using relevant information for the management team to identify the specific uniqueness of each of the products. We can have tags, for example, for production, for marketing, for departments, for budget holders, etc. Tagging is important, but it's also, let's say, sensitive. Anyone can create a tag if they can create a service. If you have permissions to create a service, you have permissions to create a tag. This is a pretty important part. Okay, now, if we are tagging, if we decide to start tagging folks, we need to remember that whatever we add will be available for all the other users to see it and use it. Okay, for example, if I create a tag right now, here, and I call this a division, and let's say I add here marketing, every new product I create after this will be allowed to use the division tag. This means that the tags becomes global, okay? 
And by default, because this is an exception, but by default, no one can limit the tax. There is an option to do that. We'll discuss that later. But by default, it's not possible. Okay? Now, if I have tax, check this out. Is this in Spanish? Yes, it's in Spanish. And if you speak Spanish, you know this is Spanish, right? You see a warning, an error, a notification saying, Arturo, you're using a different language. Arturo, you're using Spanish characters. No, no errors, no warnings. That's why it's so important that when we create a product or when we create a service, we have a plan. We have designed beforehand an option or an idea on how will we will uh, take care of these tax. To avoid, to avoid our services and products being, let's say, um, maybe scrambled or to have hundreds or thousands of options for tax, right? So be careful, folks. When you create a service or a resource, remember, you have to be careful with the tax, okay? We're gonna go here, double check, create. We have our resource group. If I go to the subscription now, you can see we're here, subscription, and I scroll down to resource groups, you can hear here, settings and resource groups. Inside of it, I have now all those that I have created, including the 305 of this class, okay? This is the plan of the first designing process. Management groups, subscriptions, and resource groups. Any questions so far? Remember, we have the chat. We can, we can discuss anything further if needed. This is the first thing, folks. If I open my resource group now, we can see here, I have different things. For example, you can see here the tags that I'm using. I don't have any. I can add tags in here, and as you can see, they will be available for the child products, okay? Once created, Ankit, once created, you are allowed to work with the tags once they are created, okay? But you cannot remove the tag from the global pool. You have to do it with a, a scripting process. So it's, it's an important thing, okay? Some purposes of the tax folks, we have that question. Um, for example, budget control. You can create a report of payments or costs based on tax. Check this out. I mean, this is, this is a good demo for you to see. If I go here to my cost management tool, and here I create a report, let's say subscription. You can see here my subscription and resource group, right? So I have the cost of my complete subscription. If I need to know where am I spending the money, I can actually take a look on the tax. I can go here and say, hey, give me an analysis. Check this out. That's one of the main purposes of tagging. Give me an analysis. Let's wait for it. I can add a filter. I can select a tag and say, only show me the cost of the services uh, based on marketing or now based on sales. That's one of the main purposes of tagging folks. Another one is to create reports of usage. Show me how many connections, how many authentication requests, show me uh, the amount of data, terabytes or megabytes shared by specific services tagged as production. Then you can go and say, hey, it looks like my products are actually being used more on the marketing division than the, uh, I don't know, sales division, okay? So um, it's part of it. And we can also use them, following questions, uh, uh, the one that we have from, from Abhishek, we can also use them for scripting. You can target resources based on tag. You can say delete all the resources tagged as testing or delete all the resources based on subjects. So that's that's part of the things that, that we can actually do, okay? Again, the idea is that we have a metadata piece of information. How we use it is based on our business as usual. You can see on my screen, we have an option to filter uh, based on tag, but there are also scenarios where we can actually uh, use them as a target or use them as a searching tool or use them just for reporting. Tax are important, folks. And the next thing I'm going to show you is actually how do we control these tax? How do we make sure that no one creates a tax 
that could be against my needs or that could be repetitive, right? Because we can have, for example, a tag that says, is this production in a Y instead of a one or instead of a true? And the three values, one, yes, Y or true, now four values, are actually real or are actually correct, but hey, they are the same. That's why when we plan on our research time, we have to keep in mind what will be the purpose, how they might get used, and the things that we might need. Okay, it's important we have a proper plan for tagging. We can, as you saw, we can remove them later, we can work with them later. It's not like, hey, the tag is not working, and now, my friend, you have to start all over again. No, we can get rid of, get rid of them, we can create policies, we can do a lot of things. Don't get scared if you have not planned for this, okay? But it's an option that we have when we talk about the tagging. Now, all these folks comes to a specific scenario. How do we, and this is gonna sound weird, but how do we control the behavior of the users and the services to align to the needs of, the needs of my company? How do you make sure that the users behave the way you want? The services behave the way you want. There are two things in Azure that we can use for that. And I think I will learn to say that these are pretty important for a healthy functional level in our subscriptions. We have Azure policies, folks, here, and we have role-based access control. These are two different, two different topics related to we we IT users, uh, let's say, controlling our complete behavior. Let's talk about this. First of all, the policies. I'm going to show you this in a second. But what is a policy? Think about this scenario. You are going to let your users, you're going to give them the permissions and options to create their own resources. OK? Every one single user in your company has the, uh, let's say, the permissions to create a virtual machine. That's good, right? What if I told you that you can create virtual machines that will cost you $3 a month and virtual machines that will cost you $100 uh, a month, or even better, a thousand hundred or $100,000 a month, or $500,000 a month, half a million dollars a month? Believe it or not, there are sizes of computers of that price. What if you use one of your products and services to exist in the European Union? Based on geopolitical limitations and GDPR, I need all my computers to be in the European Union. How do I do that? What if I want all my resources to exist only uh, on this specific location, let's say, UK South in London, and all of them be named UK hyphen and whatever they want. UK hyphen virtual machine one. UK hyphen network, uh, marketing network. What if we want that, folks? What if that's part of the things that we are uh, planning to include? There are a lot of reasons and there are a lot of cases where you might control this a little bit of like in a manual experience, right? But there are also scenarios where you can control everything using the policies. The policies are here for that type of compliance. Okay? Some considerations about the policies, folks. For example, always try to apply the policy on the highest scope. Remember the hierarchy I mentioned? Remember I said we have management group, subscription group, resource group? Well, what if I put the policy on the management group? Automatically, it will inherit to the subscription, to the resource group, right? The idea of using this uh, type of hierarchy, this type of assignation, is that we know that everything below that level will also be controlled by my policy. How the policy is evaluated, folks? 
is an important one. How do I evaluate the policy? How do I know if the policy will kick in or if the policy won't work? That's important, right? Well, we need to know, we need to understand there are multiple types of policies, okay? We have policies that will be applied if the device or the service doesn't meet the requirements and there are policies that will be applied only, only after the product has been completely configured. Example, there is a policy I can create to put a monitoring agent in all the virtual machines. If I create a virtual machine, the monitoring agent will actually be installed. Take a note in here for the examples. There are policies that will be evaluate or audit, if not exist, audit, A-U-D-I-T, audit, if not exist, and there are policies that will be called deploy, if not exist. What's the difference? The audit one, my friends, will only show you the resource, the service, the subscription, the object as non-compliant because the policy cannot modify the object. Example, locations. If I create a policy, let's say, to use their European Union regions, okay? If, we, if I create a policy just for the European uh, regions to be used, and I had a computer running before the policy was created in the United States, that policy, specifically the location one, for example, is not going to let you, or is not going to automatically move the computer from the US to the European Union. It won't work like that. It won't do it. It has no enough power to say, okay, the computer was there before my time. I should bring it according to my needs. That's not gonna happen, folks, okay? What do we do here? What do we do is we reduce the result to a pretty huge red alert saying, this computer is non-compliant. Why? Because my compliance says that I should have my computers in the European Union. Based on that, you, the administrator, the designer, the user, the owner, you decide what to do. Okay? You can see on the third bullet of this slide. Okay, if the device is marked as non-compliant, what should I do? That's, remember, that is the audit, if not exist. There is a policy, folks. There is a policy, uh, for example, called deploy if not exist, or the type of policy. The agent, as I said, all the computers I create should have the monitoring agent installed. What do I do if there is no monitoring agent? The deploy if not exist will install. Not all the policies can do this. It depends on it depends on the type of policy, but most of the times, the policies that require a specific type of configuration or a specific type of, uh, let's say, installation are actually taken by deploy. I had a computer before the policy. The policy is created today. The policy that we created today is actually going to be used um, to deploy the agent. The computer that was there before will automatically be remediated and will have the agent installed. I don't have to do anything. The policy will do it on my behalf. I know it sounds weird, right? Like letting the policy take the decision, but hey, that's a benefit we have. We can use the policies to control how the services behave, okay? Now, Let's take a look. We're going to go through a demo here, and we will have a small break so you can get some coffee or stretch the legs. Five, six minutes, and we'll be back for the second half, the explanation of the labs, and to complete our first two hours of session. Let me show you here, folks. We're going to go back to Azure. We're going to go here. I have the policies in here. If you don't see them on your Azure platform or wherever you're working, you can look for them on the search bar. Okay, we can go here, say Azure policy. Okay, that's that's another option that we have. Now, these are my policies. 
To start with, whenever we land into Azure, folks, you'll see that you have multiple policies listed. Okay? By default, this is important, when we talk about security in Azure, we get by default something called the Azure Security and Compliance Baseline. That means that we get a lot of policies created by default for our services. This is whenever we enable the security of Azure. That's a different topic, but it's important because you might get here, you might scroll down and you will see this. And you might think, hey, that is not mine. Don't worry. This, my friends, is enabled when you get into the security posture. Okay, so that's there by default. Now, we have on the authoring page that we have here on the left, we have the different definitions of policies and what services are being assigned as protected by the policy on the assignments. Okay, we have by default 1,600, 700 policies. There is no exact number because every week we get a few new policies, some of them are retired, etc. So for free and included with your subscriptions, you get, uh, let's say, a hundred and, and sorry, a thousand and five hundred to start with. There are options, folks, where you may want to create your own policy. Remember the tax. Remember, I said, I said, hey guys, we need to do something about the tax. Well, guess what? We can actually do something about the tax in here. We can create a policy, folks just to block the names of the tax or the values of the tax. Or I can create a policy to select a specific list of tax to apply to a specific subscription, to a specific resource group. So that default configuration I mentioned, where the tax are open for anyone, can be revert in here. I can go here. I can say, create a new definition. Where do I want to save it? This is just to save it, not assign, okay? This is to save the policy. I'm not assigning it yet. Be careful because you might think that this is going to affect the subscription. It is not. It is just to save the definition, okay? I can go here and say, for example, tag limit is a demo. And I can select here, for example, if there is no category, I can say governance. And then I can use JSON to create my policy. We need to use JSON. That's a thing that we, you, you need to remember. We will need to use JavaScript objects to actually create the policy as expected. Okay? That's an important one. But at the end of the day, folks, we have our complete policy ready to be used. Once we have all these, let's say, let's use that default definition. I click save and I'll have this policy ready to be assigned. Okay, remember what I said, this is just saving. So I have another policy added to the list of policies. Okay, that's the first thing. Now, second thing before I show you the assignation. Remember that we're talking about creating a baseline to manage my product, right? Location, sizes, tiers, prices, tags, agents, configurations, etc. I mentioned five on this demo. Should I assign one by one of those five? Or can I do something about them? This is an important one. We can put multiple policies together, folks, as many as we want, many policies together in an initiative. An initiative is a group of policies. That's it. We can put two or we can put a thousand policies and call that company's initiative. Let's go back. You can see here on the overview that I have one initiative and I have three policies, you see? That's the initiative that I got by default. You can see if I open the initiative, You can see all the policies that are part of this initiative. So again, my friends, if you have the need of multiple policies targeting the same resource, 
the same resource group, the same subscription, create an initiative. Instead of assigning 100 policies one by one, put 100 policies in an initiative and then add it to the target. Okay? That's a, that's a pretty important part because uh, I've, seen, I've seen as a real example, I've seen customers of mine who have assigned three, four, five different policies to the same target without knowing that you, you could actually go for an initiative. So that's just a tip, okay? Use the initiative and that will make the things easier for you. Now, if we have uh, our policy, like we can see here, and we want to assign it now, let's check this out. We can go to assignments under authoring. There it is. And I can select to assign a policy or to assign an initiative. I can say assign a policy, and then we start going through the scope. We can say assign this policy to this subscription and only to the resource group we created for this class. There it is. The only target of the subscription will be this. Or we can do it the other way around. I can clear the selections and then select all the resources except this one. You see, it's the same. It's the same as you saw. One is explicit inclusion and the other one is explicit exclusion. I can ex explicitly select the one I want to include, the AC305, or I can actually exclude them all and just leave one. That's up to you. Okay, so I have now everything ready. Well, the next thing is the actual policy. What would I like to have, folks? As I said, I can add here, for example, the one I was mentioning for the, uh, for the regions. I want all my services to be created only on the UK. I want my services to be a specific size. We pick from the definitions. Let's go here. You can see, you can see what I was mentioning. Between 1,600 and 1,700. So you can see here I have, I have uh, 1,656. So <laughs> you can go through all the policies if you want and see all the options available given by Microsoft. But I'm going to select here, UK location. You can see restrict location, allowed location for Cosmos, allowed allow location for, uh, for auditing, all the resources, backups, configuration, standard locations, that's the one I want, the resource groups, etc. I'm going to select here the location. I'm going to call this UK. Bio 5 demo. So there we are. Let's put this is a demo. And we continue. We have the basics. Now, depending on the type of policy you selected, you'll have different um, parameters that you can pass to the policy. For example, if you select a policy for sizes where you are going to allow a specific sizes to be used, you'll see here a list of the different computer sizes or network sizes or database sizes, okay? It depends a lot on the type of policy. Since I'm using a locations policy, the only thing I can do here is select the specific locations. I can go here and say, for example, UK South. No, I have no UK South on my subscription, no, I do. There are some, there are some regions you might not see depending on the subscription you have, just an FYI, okay? This is the one in London. I can go next and I can continue. And then folks, this is where the magic happens, okay? We have, we have to select what is going to happen if the policy is supposed to remediate. What if the policy has deploy if not exist? This is what I was mentioning before we went for the demo. If the policy is supposed to modify, we can allow the policy to do it automatically. We can let the policy take that decision on their hands by adding, for example, a managed identity. 
this policy will have its own user. And that user, that policy user, will be used to install, to modify. In this specific case, folks, that's redundant and useless <laughs> because the policy is not going to modify anything. Okay? So if I do it, if I, if I change that, the policy won't actually modify anything. It's not going to work. I mean, I can do it. I can create it. But the policy is not going to modify the region. If the object was somewhere else before the region policy, the only thing I'll see, as I said, is a notification saying the service is non-compliant. OK, so that's the thing. I can go here, say, put this on UK. There it is. You can see there is no deploy if not exist. We're good. We go next. What would you like the message to be, the non-compliance message? So how are you or the administrators going to identify that the policies, let's not say violating, but the policy is not being met? What will be your call? What will be your decision for that to be shown or to be identified? And I can go here and say, uh, this or you are not using an allowed region. That's it. That's for my example, okay? I go next. You can confirm everything we configured. It looks good. We hit create. Now, the policy is being assigned important folks. A policy might take up to 10 minutes to kick in. So if I go now and I immediately try to create something outside of the UK, it might work, okay? Let's give it a try. I'm gonna go here to network. That's the fastest one. I'm gonna create a network on the US just to see if the policy is already there. You can see here, let's say net one. You see there is no error yet. If I go review and create, I'm still allowed to create a, the object. Again, folks, 10 minutes, okay? Wait 10, 10 20 minutes in, uh, before uh, double checking the policy. I can hit create and you can see, even though my policy says UK only, I'm still allowed to create it. I think it kicked in while I was creating. Let's see. Yes, we actually, you can see here, the region is not allowed. So it kicked in while I was creating, that's a good thing. How do we know, before we get to this error message, if the policy is ready? There is an option, folks. Let me show you. Well, once the policy is ready, if I try to create on my personal resource group here, I have a policy to create only in the United States on my resource group, the personal one, okay? If I try to create outside of the United States on my personal group, you can see it automatically blocks it. You see? The UK policy we just created should, should do the same in the next few minutes. It's now stopping from creating, but we should have, or we shouldn't have actually, the option to hit create if the policy was fully confirmed. Okay, that's an important one. So you can see here, my policy is almost ready. So that's how the policy works. Now, once the policy is ready, folks, let's go back to policies. Here it is. We can actually see the result of the policy. You can see, for example, this one, North America. And we can see the detail of the objects. You see? As I said, I have created these watchers in different countries and different regions before I created the policy. That was a few years ago now, like a couple of years ago. This policy, as I explained already, is not mod modifying anything. It's just showing that it's non-compliant. I can do something about it, folks. I can open, for example, the network watcher, check the details, and see what's the error. It's in West India. It's non-compliant. 
And that was the message I added. You are far from home. I, I, the owner, have to manually move this specific object to a new region. Okay, that's, that's an important thing to consider. Now, to wrap up this, we'll take a small break. There is an option, I'm gonna mention this because it's important, but it's not like the, on the exam, but there is an option where we can have policies for global compliance, okay? You can select, you can go here, for example, to security, Microsoft Defender. In here, folks, you have something called security and regulatory compliance, the purple one. We can click on the, on the purple one and we can see initiatives. You can see here initiatives, folks, groups of policies that are aligned with a benchmark. You can see ISO, SOC. I can add more if I want. I can add GDPR baselines. I can add FedRAMP. I can add ITAR. I can add ISO 27000-2003. I can add HIPAA. What I'm mentioning is that we have the option of creating or using the full configure base. Let's check this out. Let me show you here. You can see the plans that I have. Let me just go here. There it is. And you can see industry and regulatory standards that are groups of policies, our initiatives, that's all. That I can add here, you see, to my subscription to be compliant to any of these things. UK, NHS, ISO 2013, Azure CIS, Canada, NIST, New Zealand, FEDRA, Malaysia. I can bring my own definitions and create my own compliance standard. For a certification as a company, for a authorization as a company, this, my friends, is amazing because you don't have to configure the initiative. The initiative is there now. You just have to add it and see what resources that you might have are actually meeting the compliance and which resources are not. You see what I'm saying? The idea of this compliance folks, it's to actually increase the level of trust and confidence maybe the market or the users have on our product, on our service, on our company. I can add any of these, for example, let's say uh, Azure CIS. You can see here the initiative definition, and then check this out. I'm gonna I'm gonna create and then you'll see it. We have the remediation, we have the compliance message, and here we have every single policy that is part of this initiative. You can see storage accounts should be restricted from network access to private, for example. Every policy we see here will actually pop into the object and the object will be allowed to use it. Okay, I highly recommend folks that you take your time to analyze different initiatives and the different policies so it's easier for you to decide if it's already there or you should create something new just to start from scratch, okay? These are the foundations of the benchmark, okay? So this is the first half, folks. We still have uh, another hour of topics to, to, to go through and discuss. Any more questions you have, please let us know in the chat. As you have seen, our moderators are actually helping and answering back the questions that you, that you have not fully related to what I'm showing on screen because of the limitation of times but I'm also taking, taking a look on the questions whenever they come up. This is the first half. So we have seen, let's, let's wrap up what we have done so we can take a five, six minute break and come back. We have seen the hierarchy of Azure, right? Management groups, subscriptions, resource groups, and finally, the resources. We have seen the distribution of services uh, that we can use that we can actually have 
and be part of, for example, policies or management solutions. After the break, we're going to talk about how to manage the users, because these are two different options, folks. One thing is you controlling the products, as I shown here, how to configure them, how to allow them or block them from doing something. And a different thing is how to block or allow the users from doing something, right? There are users that you may want to do something with more permissions than others. And that's completely normal. That's the second part. So we have seen up to this point the governance for resources, okay? For a computer, for a network, for a database. We will see, we will see the usage of this same type of approach, but based on the users and, and, the, and their behavior. Okay, so let me put here a, a small clock. We can track down our timer for the break. Let's, what time is it? We're, we have been here for an exact hour, so we can take seven minutes here. So you can stretch the legs, get some coffee, get some water, maybe some soda or whatever you prefer. And we will continue after this with the second half set up above the, the introduction to the last and we will be done for our first session. My friends, thank you very much for your time this first half of the day. I'll come back with you in seven minutes and we will discuss about the other topics we have left and the, the study cases you have for practices. Okay, thank you very much, folks. I'll talk to you back in a few minutes.
We're back, team. We're back. Let me just open here the camera. We're back, folks. You're saying hi again for those of you who join after we start the introduction. As I said, I keep the camera off because we have, uh, well, to, to use a proper bandwidth uh, balance, and I prefer you to have a uh, clearer voice and my screen being shared as, as close as possible to real time than you see me talking, right? But again, I'm opening my camera so you can see I'm still here with you. I'll open it again at the end of today's session and I'll be doing the same during the week. So I'm back here, folks. And you you see me turning around because I have a three monitor set up and I need to see where am I and I get a little bit lost when I use the camera. But we're gonna continue now. We're gonna continue with the second half. We have seen a lot of things up to this point, right? We saw the hierarchy, the different uh, things that we have on the hierarchy, and then we saw the usage of uh, the policies to control the behavior of my services. The next thing that we have, and personally speaking, of this topic is one of my favorite features. It's called the RBAC, the role based access control. Okay? This RBAC, folks, uh, because there are no labs, Neil. Uh, that's something I've been mentioning. There are no labs for this class. Uh, the class has only study cases based on paper design because it's a design class. It's the only class like this in the whole Azure track. And I, 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 I'm sorry I, I diverged from the topic, but I, I, I wanted you to be sure that you're like knowing why that's the reason, okay? For all of you folks, if you wonder why you don't have a lab like all the other classes, it's because we have only white, uh, white paper design, uh, whiteboarding design, and paper straightforward design, okay? So let's continue what I said, my favorite topic of this lesson, <laughs> not of Azure. We have the RBAC folks, the role-based access control. What is the RBAC? The idea of using RBAC, my friends, it's to grant the permissions are needed for something pretty specific. If you hire me, it's just a hypothetical example. I'm not asking for a job, but if you hire me, my friends, and you say, Arturo, you're gonna be responsible of this virtual machine. I hire you to keep this computer up and running without issues 24 seven. Good, that sounds great. What type of permissions should I have? Should I have permissions for all the computers? Should I have permissions to the resource group where the computer is created, to the subscription, just to the computer itself? That's, that's the type of questions you need to ask yourself. How do you allow a specific user or a list of users to control computers, preventing them, for example, of modifying your network or modifying a, a storage or a database on the same, on the same location? That's a business as usual question, right? That's my that's the idea of the role with access control. That's why I was mentioning. A couple of considerations. When you assign a role on a higher level of the scope, you automatically get that role in the child objects. And I'm sorry to say this, but there is no way of breaking that inheritance. This means, folks, that if I create, let's say, a resource group called production and a resource group called testing, and I add a user as a manager of production, all the products inside of production will be managed by that user. If I assign permissions to the subscription called uh, United States, and below I have production and testing, the permissions will inherit to production and testing. This is a pretty important thing, folks, because right now, even though Microsoft has addressed this as a, not as an issue, because it is not an issue. Even though Microsoft has, has addressed this as, as a known complaint, there is no breakings or breaking of that, of that inheritance. Okay, so, that's a, an important part. Now, let me show you here how it works, okay? I think this is pretty important. So let me go back to my portal and show you. I have a user, 
I have a lot of users. I'm going to show you how to create users and how to design for users on Wednesday, okay? But right now, one of the users I have is Neil Gaiman, but Neil Ni A L no, no Ni I E L or however it's it's written right now because he changed a lot. But I have Neil Gaiman on my list. <laughs> so, what if I want that user to control only a network I have in here? I don't have any. Let me create a network. So I can show you that. Let me go here. Add a new network. Let's add here. Just for the test, you can see the policy is now kicking in. You see? Now it's fully deployed. That's a good thing. Let's go here to your case out. Let's call this VNet1. 305. I, I selected your case out. I'm my worst enemy right now. Right? Let's see. That's a, that's a weird thing because, oh, I know what happened. <laughs> you know what happened? This is a good demo. It was, I promise, this was not my intention, okay? But it's a good demo. Check this out. You know why I'm not allowed to create even though I selected UK's out? The reason is that I have, check this out. I have the UK, this one, allowing only UK on the resource group, and I have this one on the whole subscription. So this policy is overriding this policy. This is on the resource group, the UK 305. It's on the resource group, while the North America, it's on the subscription. So it's automatically blocking my object. So let me just do something here. Let me add in here on the parameters is the So this is just to skip my own blockage that I added without intention. So that's not going to kick in immediately. So we will have to wait. There it is. No, it's going to take a while. But we'll be back. So let me see if I can like jump through it now that I added that exception. I'll have to wait a couple of minutes. OK, well, while we wait, let me show you the next slide, and I'll, I'll be back for that demo to take place. So if we have RBAC, you can see here that we can combine different things. The RBAC for the user behavior and the policy for the service behavior. See this decision map. Azure Admin Blue Guy we have there on the bottom left is trying to create something. Does that user, does the user have the permissions to do that? If the answer is yes, then is the, rest, the service or the resource that she or he is selecting matching the configuration that I request via the policy, the region, the size, the price, the tier? The answer is yes, deploy the resource. So you can see how we are building together a solution for my management to take place. Let's see if we can create now the network. I want you to see this in, in action. So RG305, name, come on, <laughs> play along with me. It's not there yet. So I'm going to do this in a different one. So we can just see this happening. So let's call this VNet1, easy 305. View and create there and create. Just in case you're wondering, why am I creating the uh, a network? It's because it's the service that takes the you can see there the least amount of time to be deployed, less than ten seconds to create. So I always do that for a demo. Okay, now, there is no special reason on me selecting a demo a network. So there we are. Let's do it as I mentioned. We will see our network popping up in here in a couple of seconds. There it is. Now, from here, folks. Well, I have a question I would like to read so you will know uh, the answer. Uh, Max is asking if you will receive the slides. The answer is no, not the actual slide deck, but 
you get access to the learning pad where you have most, if not all, of the uh, maps, dashboards, screenshots, and things that I use on the slides. So the slides are copyright, the actual uh, uh, PowerPoint file, but you have all the same images and, and content on the learning pad, the one you get for free. So that's for all of you folks, in case you were wondering if you have a copy of the slides, let's say not the actual file, but the actual content will be shared with you. You have access to that, okay? So, sorry for the side note. Let's see that principle of rule assignation, okay? What about the assignation? What about the resources and the role base? Thanks to you, Max. We have here, check this out, something called the access control. Whenever you want to monitor who can do what on your service, your resource group, your subscription, or your management group, you refer to the access control, okay? That's an important one. So from here, what I can do is say, hey, access control and roles. There are three default roles that you can use, sorry, four, four, four default roles you can use everywhere. And one role that you can uh, uh, combine to have a little, let me show you, it's easier. Role assignments. I'm going to click on Add, Add a Role, and Select. Take this note for the exam, folks, those of you taking the exam. Every service, product, and resource in Azure will always have owner, contributor, reader, and user access admin. Those are four roles that you'll find everywhere. Okay? Now, important. I can go to the owner and assign it. What is the definition of each of these? The owner has every permission it's needed. It can modify anything they want and also assign other owners. So if I assign the, the role of ownership to one of my users, that user will be able to assign other users as owners. That might be the intention, don't get me wrong. But if you want to be in control of who assigns whom, the best practice is to use the contributor. The contributor, my friends, will let you control everything that happens except assigning other users, okay? So I hope I'm clear. The reader, as you might imagine, it's only about adding users, that's all. Sorry, about checking the process. And the user access admin is the one that is about adding users, this one, okay? Every other role you see will depend on the product that you're using. Now, if I say we hire someone, you can select a user here. I hire uh, Lam or Colin. I hire Colin to be the contributor, the administrator of my network. And that's all I want him to do. If that's the case, folks, sorry, there was a mosquito hunting me. <laughs> if that's the case, if, if that's what we actually want to do or what we need to do, the next step is just to confirm, right? Colin is now a contributor on this specific product, this network. I click on review. I, I forgot to add it. Sorry. Colin, select and assign. We're good? Assign. Now, something important the inheritance. You can see Colin is a contributor on this specific resource. But guess what? My wife, my wife's user, is actually on the subscription. We can go to the subscription. Check the access control, and you can see on this resource subscription level, she is the owner, but she's also owner of a higher level. Remember the hierarchy we mentioned first thing in the morning, right? Management group, subscription, resource group. She's also, if I go all the way up to the management group, you can see here we have the management group access control again. 
roles. And on this level, I have my wife's user, my user as owner, and my user as security from a higher management group. You see, it's inherent. The highest management group I have is the root group that we saw on the slides when we started today. If we assign on that level, everything goes below that. You cannot break the inheritance and you cannot remove a user from, an, from a higher level. So I can try to remove and you see, inherit role is not allowed to be removed. Okay, if I drill down all the way back to the network, I can see all those roles here available. You see? So that's why I was saying, folks, be pretty careful on where you are assigning your products. It might get to the point where you have someone with permissions over a child object that you didn't even know. And that, you know, that could be a security issue. So that's why we are designing here, okay? Another, another uh, best practice or tip for designing before we move to the next topic. When we are assigning this type of roles, a best practice is to use uh, groups, user groups. If I have a group called uh, network administrators and I put all the possible network admins in that, it will be easier to see who has permission in all the networks on instead of going through all the networks one by one to see who has permission in there. I know that every user on the network group is actually allowed to modify all the networks through the subscription, through the portal, right? I mean, it's just an example, okay? It's not maybe not possible in some scenarios. You have one single person, you prefer to have it explicit, but that's fine. What I, what I was mentioning is, hey, it is important that we we are careful on, on who and where do we assign their roles. This, my friends, is a role-based access control. If we combine policies with role-based access and we remember the hierarchy we discussed on the first module, well, we have now a governed solution. What if I have all this? What if I already know the subscriptions I, I want, the type of resources, the type of resource groups, the policies, and their roles. And then I need to replicate that configuration somewhere else. There is a product, folks, for governance called the Blueprint. The Azure Blueprint, my friends, is actually an option, let me just get the laser, it's actually an option that we can use to put all those things together and then just replicate that configuration into a brand new subscription. What if you took, let's say, why it's not moving here. <laughs> what if you took, um, I don't know, three months designing policies. You have now all the initiatives and policies you want, including custom policies. You took another month designing the role-based access control. Okay? You took another month without uh, uh, usage of the users for the uh, templates. At the end of the day, folks, once you took all this together, what you are planning to design is actually a solution that meets the same requirements you have before. This means that those let's say six months you took to configure subscription one can be replicated immediately into subscription two, three, and so on. That is the idea of the blueprints, folks. The blueprints are pretty useful because once you have a standard, once you have a functional governance solution, you don't have to recreate it manually for other subscriptions, other scenarios. You can actually design the blueprints and then just replicate and drop them to configure completely in a matter of minutes. That's the idea of a blueprint. Just an important FYI, my friends, the blueprints are actually on preview, okay? A side note for those of you who haven't used Azure before, 
when you go and see a product, say in preview, check this out. Preview, you see? Whenever you see preview, folks, it means that the product is fully released, but it's not yet ready to be used in production. Okay? If you use this in production and you have an issue, you don't have a service level agreement. Microsoft will help you as they always do. They will see what happened. You can ask for help for a ticket for support. And they will make it work. But there is no service level agreement. That means that you don't get a credit or something because of the failure. Because, my friends, you were um, using a product that still goes under testing. How long this will take to get removed? We don't know. It might take a day. It might take a year. They, they will keep testing it. But we have an option to create a blueprint. Okay, we still have the option of using this if we need to, and that's a good thing because we can start testing how the blueprints look when we when we go to our product, and they, then based on that, decide if this is what we want to use. Let me show you here. Remember, folks. Well, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll take that back in a minute. So I can go here and say I want to create a blueprint. Let's go this 305 demo. No, I cannot use the spaces. I'm going to save this blueprint on my subscription here. And then I'm going to add the artifact. The artifact are the roles, the resource groups, the templates, the policies. So I can go and say, hey, Give me a couple of policies here. We can see, for example, remember the initiatives, the group of policies I'm going to add here. This one, I'm going to add, let me grab a different one, another definition, for example. Let's say, uh, I don't know, here, UK official. And I'm going to add locations. I can select here. Locations, add. I can also add, for example, roles. I will always like to have an owner of the new subscription. We can select who by default if we always use the same owner, or we can let the users decide whom when they create the, the when they create the subscription with this blueprint. It depends on you. Okay, you have to call the shots here. Do you like or would you like to have this assigned right now or let the users have it later? I'm going to say, for example, I will always have the same owner, my wife. It's not a joke. <laughs> so I, I need to wait here to, to pop up, but I can go here and say, my wife. There it is. And add it. She will always be the owner anytime we use this blue. That might be a real case for you folks. You always have the same owner, right? I mean, hypothetically speaking, I can do that. I can select to have our always a resource group call production. I always want to have an RG call production. Where it's gonna be created. Let me just put this also on the actual name. We can have the tax that we will inherit the moment the subscription is created, you see? I click add and we're good. Inside of production, I would like to have a different type of policies, a different type of roles, etc. That's what I'm saying here, folks. The blueprints will give you a lot of control on the starting setup of your policy. Okay, so um, it is important that when we're going to go through a blueprint, we remember this is just the initial configuration. If I save this, and then publish, let me just save the draft. We have a question from Vlad, how those preview effect services, uh, there is no exact knowledge, Vlad, on what exactly the impact, impact might be, since this is a test, it's a testing service, fully released for testing, but still a test. We have no um, exact knowledge of the possible implications of being, um, Preview, important folks, we are not supposed to use preview features in production. 
if we are concerned about the possible impact of a preview feature, the reason is we shouldn't use it in production. We can use it on test, we can use it on quality assurance, we can use it on dev, but if it's a critical production solution, we should not be using preview. That's a state on the Microsoft agreement. And when we are designing a, a solution based on preview features, we should include a recommendation saying, this is for testing or quality control only. Okay, I hope that answers the question, Vlad. And this brings light to all of you folks, do not use preview features in production. Okay, that's an important one. So we have my blueprint ready. Well, it's gonna take a while right, to show. Let's wait for it. It's here. Yes, and here it is. So we have my blueprint, you see? I have my objects. I can publish the blueprint, and whenever I get a new subscription, I can select this to be the baseline of configuration. These policies will be there, these initiatives will be there, these users and roles will be there. You see? That's the idea of a blueprint. I know. It's frustrating to know that such an amazing tool is still on, on, on preview, right? We will like, we will love to use this in production. I, I highly suggest that you analyze the process. You already know the policies. You already saw the initiative. You already saw the objects. So it's easier to replicate this manually, even though the blueprints are still a thing. Play with them, folks. Use them to see the benefits and stuff. And once created, well, you can continue using your services on business as usual, regardless of Blueprint being used or not at the beginning of the assignation. Okay? So these are the Blueprints, folks. We saw policies, role access control, and Blueprints. Remember, all these apply on different levels from the management groups to the resources. To wrap it up and talk about the, the extra, well, not the exercises, the lab, that is not uh, and some love. Talking about that, the last topic we have is the designing for landing zones. What is a landing zone? You may be thinking, okay, that sounds weird. <laughs> when we talk about a landing zone, we're talking about asking, let's say, not asking, because it's not actually like a request. What we do when we create a landing zone is putting our stuff together as governance, okay, on a governance approach. So everything that gets deployed, everything that gets, um, let's say, created as new for my hierarchy will land, that's the reason of the name, will land on a dedicated structure to be tested, to be configured. Check the diagram. You can see the second, the second level of management group, and the second management group from left to right is called the landing zone, right? This one. That landing zone that we have on screen, folks, is actually not mandatory, but it's a best practice because we will be able, folks, of configuring stuff in there, testing it, and once ready, deploying maybe into a production subscription. It's a pretty common practice. Again, it's not mandatory. But if we're going through a cloud adoption process where, hey, we need to be prepared, we need to be ready, we need to understand how it works. We have never used this. Let's see how it behaves. It's more like a production pre-stage than a testing stage. Because on testing, we might still be developing, right? We might still be configuring. No, when we get into a landing zone, we have the exact same thing before production. It's like a, like a pre-staging solution. Again, it's not mandatory. I'm not going to say that you should always uh, use landing zones. I have, and let's be honest, I have seen, I have worked with a lot of customers without this. And they do pretty good. But as a good practice for all of you or anyone who you are dealing with, uh, adopting new products or adopting the cloud, a landing zone is a pretty useful option. Okay, so this is the first topic. We're not done yet, folks. We still have a few more minutes on our agenda to complete, but there are some things I would like to discuss before we, we call it a day or while we go for the exercises. But remember, folks, this landing zone, it's the last topic of this lesson, and we have a little bit of a review. What we did today, folks, was we discussed the hierarchy. 
right? Management groups, subscriptions, resource groups, and resources. We discuss the governance for both of them, being the identity uh, management, that is the uh, role with access control, and the service management that are the policies. We saw how to put them together on an assignation or uh, an initiative, and then we saw uh, the usage of a blueprint as a standard. Okay, so we were capable of discussing like most of our things, most of our stuff, uh, without any type of interruption. So that's the list of topics of today. Now, I know, I know that uh, this might sound weird for those of you who just joined, but remember, folks, there is no handsome lab. Okay. This class and specifically this class comes with a principle of theoretical design. That's the reason why the class is called design. It's, a, it's, it's on the name. Okay, so it is quite important, we well, remember, it's the only class in the whole Azure track, that being like 30 different classes, that has no hands-on practice. There are no uh, vouchers, for the uh, for Azure, we don't actually use the portal at all. I would like to explain why, because I saw a couple of questions there. The reason why don't we, why don't we get that's actually the, the, what I was going to mention, Edward. Edward is asking, will it be more useful to attend the last of the AC hundred four? The AC hundred four is the management class that goes before this one. Okay. If you follow the correct path, you will take the AC-104, you will have a hands-on practice on how to create a policy, how to create a user, how to create a subscription, and then you'll come to this class knowing that hands-on management, and then you'll design following best practices. You'll take these exercises as design. Okay? So I'm just going to mention uh, the whole process because I see a few issues there. So, Edward, I think that actually answers your question. If you don't know how to manage the products, AC104 is the first class you should have taken because that's a management class. And then you come here and you have a complete design for, it's called design for uh, uh, perfection. I know it sounds pretentious, right? But it's the idea that we actually know how to use it. Now let's design it the best way possible. Now, these exercises are just case studies, folks, okay? Case studies and that's it. If you try to start a lab, you'll see that you, don't, you cannot start the labs because there is no environment. I'm gonna show you where the labs are in a minute. I have a question on the chat, I would also like to read it, that says, what do I do then to finish these labs, right? How do I submit or what do I do? Okay, let's remember, and this is a common joke on any architecting and design experience that there is no correct answer when designing, right? There are best practices that might suit your needs, but are completely useless for someone else. So that's an important thing we have to remember. That's the first thing. There is no correct answer. There is a suggested answer for these exercises that is going to help you to compare what you have and the results. I'm going to show you that. I'm going to explain that in a second there. So um, that's what actually I wanted, to, I wanted to mention. Max is asking, okay, is the solution uh, correct or what? At the end of, uh, at the beginning of tomorrow, those of you who took the laugh, I'll show you the suggested answer for today's laugh. Okay, the suggested answer. Uh, when we don't have a live session during the laugh. That means, well, we don't have a live, but we don't have a, a voice screen share session like we do here. So, it's not like we are reviewing. Today, you have the chance of going through the labs, like prepare your suggested solution, and tomorrow, first thing in the morning, I'll show you the solution. I'll take 10, 15 minutes at the beginning of each day to show you, okay, this is what we should have done. If you were close to this or that, that's it, okay? Again, it's not like there is one single correct option. Whatever you see me showing tomorrow, it's a suggestion, okay? now. The case study of this lesson, folks, goes like this. I'm going to show you where to get the whole case study. Don't, don't worry, okay? I'm not, like, just showing this. But here, what are different ways? 
Our company, in this case, Tailwind Traders, could organize their subscriptions and their groups to meet the requirements they have. They have product development, marketing, and sales. That's the first thing, okay? They have apparel and supporting goods. Each unit will require a subunit responsible of tracking their own spends. How do we track the spend? I gave you the answer in a demo. The IT enterprise team will be responsible of creating the report. Now, the company has a new project that is coming back that we need to control and create. The CFO, the finance officer, is actually trying to be sure that all the costs are actually captured. How do I track down the cost of a specific project? I mentioned that one too. For the testing phase, I should use cheaper computers. How do I limit the sizes? The computer should all be named in a specific way. I also mentioned that. Any instance that is non-compliant should be uh, like shown immediately as non-compliant. All the things we have here, folks, are actually are actually shown by me. We're shown during the process, right? So I'm going to show you here where you can get this actual option. Okay, let me go here back to my browser. No, this is not it. Just give me one second. Let me find my browser because I get lost in so many things. Here it is. So, how do you get here, folks? Okay, I'm gonna let me go here. Just give me one one second. And here it is. Okay, so you can get here by going through the AC305 on GitHub, okay? It's pretty easy. AC305, GitHub. That's all you need. And you'll get it on the top. I would like to paste it, but we only have the questions here. I'm gonna make an announcement in a second, so you can have a, also a link, but it's easy to get here. Now, check this out. Inside of the GitHub, folks, you have the case studies, a folder for the case studies, you see? In here, you have today's case study and all the others. Remember, folks, that we have a track that I'm going to show you in a couple of minutes because we're not going to cover all this during the class. Since this is a cloud week, that means that it's a, a lot of different classes running together the same week at the same time in different hours to, just for you to have a full overview of the content. We cover a module. For example, today we cover governance. And you as homework, folks, should be taken computing. Tomorrow I will talk about relational and non-relational and you should be taken integration. On Wednesday I'll be talking about these two and you should be taken logging. I'll talk about network and you'll, you should be covering migration, okay? But at the end of the day, we do have 11 last. So if you take today one and two or you go through them during the day, Tomorrow, I will show you the results of one and two. Maybe just one and two was a homework. At the end of the week, I will share with you the proposed solutions of all of them. So you don't feel like, hey, I don't know if I was correct. Again, it's not a single right answer. It's just a suggestion that I will show. Okay, so I hope that answers a couple of the questions we have here. Now, I'm going to open governance. You can see here, this is the complete thing that I used so on my screen. You should, get, you should create an organizational uh, graphic or for example, uh, let's say an inheritance uh, diagram as you saw with a management group, with the subscriptions, the name, where will you put a policy, where will you put a role base, what will be used there? And based on that, we will have a, a proposed solution. Important folks, the whole class is like this. I want to be pretty honest, Again, I repeat, it's the only class that has no um, uh, hands-on practices. There are optional practices on the learning path that you can take if you have your own subscription, but that's not on this class. If you take the whole class, like the eight hours class, it's like this. We have half a day for theory, half a day for you for to design. We're, we check the next day first in the morning and we continue with the theory. That's how it works. And again, don't feel like this is but it's actually good because you learn how to actually decide, not only to manage. 
But again, you should have uh, experience uh, on how to do this stuff so you can have the best practices of design. Okay, so let me see if I can do this. Give me a second here. Just let me see here. I'm going to add my own question. Links. I'm going to push the question into public so you can all see it. There it is. And let me put here the links. So you can, I'm going to push the answer of my own question into um, here. This is one. And let me get the learning part here. Five. You can no, look at some flight. <laughs> no. Sure. See here the class, and you have here all the content. Okay, so I'm gonna paste this one also here. There it is. You will see the answer now, sent to all. You should see that now in the QA with both of the links to copy. Okay, the first one is the case studies, that's the part of the practice. The second one are the certification exam, so you can see here the knowledge content that we covered, okay? So this is how we set up the labs. Let's say we start using the labs, okay? I highly recommend folks that, I mean, if you already have used Azure, if you already have used some of the services, uh, this is the correct role. Actually, this, is, uh, this class has no uh, platform that someone monitors. Remember, you have to join the four sessions, the four lecture sessions, okay? And you have to join the exam prep session, the two hour session in the morning. So you can be a, can uh, yeah, a candidate for a free exam voucher, okay? So these are the sessions you have to join, the one we just complete. The next three days, and then on Friday, the exam preparation, you should be there as a participant. It's actually tracking the list. At the end, automatically checks who was on the morning sessions, the, the lecture sessions, and after that, you are part of the, the raffle of all the vouchers we have for the week. Okay, the last highly recommended, you should take the, the study cases because the exam is completely based on study cases, folks. It's not like a practice exam where you get, how do you create a user? No, it's what will you recommend to track down the cost of a new project requested by the chief finance officer. The answer is tax. The recommendation was done by the design. Okay, so again, that's mandatory, folks. It's pretty important you get this, okay? Uh, don't worry, those of you who are not actually joining tomorrow, uh, as I said, at the end of the week, I will share the solutions so you all can track them down, okay? It's an important part, thanks to you, Ralph. So don't worry. Remember, we have our, we will have recordings. I would like to repeat everything now that we're wrapping up. Last thing covered before the review. Um, thank you, thank you, Tito. Yes, it's actually the landing zone. Sorry, as I was mentioning, we have a recording. Uh, it will be available in the next ten business days. You'll find it on your uh, on your joining platform. Uh, it might be there at the end of today or in the next five, six days or 10 days, it will take tops 10 days. Remember, this is one of multiple classes taking place through the day. There is one more 305 taking place on, on Central Time in the United States, and then we have multiple other classes running. So it's pretty important that we go through that. Okay? Now, why do we have... Uh, yes, I, it, it won't be given by me, Sofian. Sofian is asking if I, if you join another 305, let's say tomorrow's uh, later class will be me. No, I'm teaching this track today. There is someone else teaching the 305 at 8 a.m. Central Time or 2 p.m. European Time, for example. Okay, but that's someone else, another training, showing that. Okay, so, but it's the same, the same plan, the same content. We follow all the same, uh, uh, let's say, uh, outline. Today's session in the afternoon will be again governance. Tomorrow will be data integration for all the sessions taking place during the day. Okay, so again, if you join another session today, it will be the same content from a different user. So maybe you will have a different perspective. That's useful, right? But it's, it's how it is, okay? So that's important. Now, 
If you take multiple classes in different hours, it counts for the track. So if you cannot join tomorrow's morning session and you join the afternoon session, you will have the two attendances, day one and day two. That won't affect your voucher and you will be able to, to participate at the end of the week. Okay, so that's, that's another thing that we have. Now, the class or the session we have in 30 minutes, well, 37 minutes, it's to support the practices and to answer any questions you may have. If you have other questions left from the content or something, it's a live Q&A, okay? And it's gonna be used via the Q&A. On control of this one, we won't actually have a full uh, um, presentation and everything, it's just the Q&A, but we have myself and we have the, our health support Joyce during that session. Since we don't have actual exercises, since we don't have actual exercises, there are no many questions you might ask because if you ask what should I use here, you will get what would you suggest. Don't think that we are being rude, okay? That's the actual intention of the class that you design on your own understanding. So if you go and ask me or ask Joyce, who is with us in the class, hey, what should I use for the CFO requirement? Well, you will get an answer like, what would you recommend? What would you suggest? You won't get a straight answer of use this service. Don't, don't, don't get mad at us. Don't think that we're being rude. That's the intention of the design class, okay? That you bring your own recommendations, okay? That's a pretty, a pretty important. The second one, as I was mentioning, is not mandatory, okay? To be eligible, remember, it's the five, the five sessions that take place on the first two hours of the class. The second, the second half, it's optional in case you have questions or you want to ask something. But again, mornings, two hours in the morning in the exam preparation, it's the mandatory attendance to be eligible for a voucher. Okay, so that's the thing. I cannot do that, Chandras, because we don't have a presenter right on that session. Since this is the plan that Microsoft offers, we cannot take control of the session like if it was a presentation class. I, I know that will be great, but it's it's meant to be like that. I'm really sorry. It's not my call. It's not our productor's call. It's actually how Microsoft delivers this session. So I'm, I'm really sorry about that. So folks, we're almost done. We have five minutes left. I'll take care of any answers you have right now live. So if any of you has another question about the sessions or something, let me know. Again, it's not mandatory to have to join, sorry, the next session, okay? It is not mandatory. You can take the labs as homework. You can go to the computing computing as, home, as homework. And then tomorrow I'll show you the, the possible solution for today's exercises. If you wanna join for a specific question, we're here to help. You can come here in 30 minutes and Joyce and myself will be answering any possible questions you might have on the Q&A section. Okay, any other questions you have, folks, let me know here. We still have four more minutes. So if you have questions about anything of the logistics, the actual topics, whatever else you might have questions about, please let me know. Remember, all these links at the end of the day will be there on you. And this is our day one. Okay, this is the theory of day one, folks. I appreciate your time. I hope to see you all tomorrow morning. Uh, for the second part of the day, and um, oh, we will see. We will see how it goes. Vlad, this is an important one. If I'm attending two different classes, morning and afternoon, can I get two vouchers? You are eligible for two vouchers. Remember, being eligible means that you'll be part of the raffle because we have a limited amount of vouchers by, by the thousands. <laughs> Don't worry. But we have more than thousands joining these classes. So if you join the five classes, afternoon and, and Morning and afternoon, you'll have two eligible seats for two different vouchers, okay? It's not a, a, a short thing that you'll get a voucher just for attending. Well, it's important you know this because we have a limited amount of vouchers, again, by the thousands, okay? So it might be the case that all of you eligible get one. I don't have the number of attendants. Obviously, we have multiple classes running, but I think that most of you, if not all, who meet the requirements might actually get one or two passes at the end, depending on the classes you are attending. But you have to be on the class, okay? Morning classes. My friends, I appreciate it. Thank you very much for your time today. 
we will stop the live session in two minutes and we will start the practices and the q a session in two minutes uh, we'll be ready to launch in 30 minutes and anyone who wants to discuss anything remember it will be just question and answers but we will be there to well, to help you with any possible things that you might come up with appreciate it a lot folks hope to see you all tomorrow and if you're taking this class with someone else enjoy the session get a different trainer so you can have a lot of different perspectives and again my friends i hope to see you tomorrow thank you very much have a great rest of your day i'll see some of you on the q a those of you not coming back for q a i'll see you tomorrow morning on our day two of the cloud week for 305 thank you folks